subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello students, welcome once again to Senior High School Hour on Joy Learning Channel. This is your tutor, Kojo Usuapia, coming to you once again. It's time for general knowledge in art, GKA. Take out your parts as usual. Jot down a few things that you need to really have knowledge about. And let's go through these lessons. I hope you are going to enjoy this very lesson. So make sure you are ready for it. It's going to be based on other lessons that we treated previously. So make sure you revise those previous ones. And then when you move on to this particular lesson, you would understand everything that goes on. Now, we are taking indigenous African arts today. It is a build on, or we are building upon the beliefs in African systems. So what is the objective for this lesson? So by the end of this lesson, you, my student, will be able to analyze the role of the indigenous African forms in our African society. Again, you should be able to describe the main characteristics of African arts. So the big question, again, what is indigenous African arts? Now, to try to explain it, indigenous African arts or Africans engaged in various art forms and activities in order to control their environment and also to meet their religious and social needs. So typical of indigenous African art forms, we categorize them into three. So we have the visual arts, the performing arts, and then the verbal arts. We are going to take these one by one. So we are going to start with the visual arts. Now, these are the arts that are appealing to the visual senses and can be manipulated by the sense of touch. Now, the visual art forms are used by the indigenous African arts, and these include the following. So there's sculpture, there's architecture, there's textiles, there's painting, there's pottery, beadwork, basketry, calabash or calabash work, leather work, blacksmithing, gold smithing, and lastly, body arts. It is very important as a student to have ideas about these various art forms performed by the indigenous African so that you will be able to understand what they do and how they do it. So we'll be taking these art forms, visual art forms, one at a time and then we'll dwell a little bit more in it. So let's start from sculpture. So on your screen, I have three images. On the far left, we have the Nook sculpture, which um, is an artwork of the indigenous uh, Nigerians. Again, in the middle, we have the Kuyaba door, known to the Ashantis of Ghana. And again, on the right hand side, again, we have the sculpture work from Nigeria. Now, sculptural figures are made from variations of materials. So the African made use of bones, clay, metal, ivory, stone, and wood. So these are some of the basic materials that we use for art forms. There are varied other materials that the African used for his art forms. So on the screen, I have the sample of some of the materials. The first is the buffalo bones, right there. Then we also used stones, that's the indigenous African, as well as elephant ivory tusk. If you care to know, you can find out more about how some of these artworks were used for sculpture. you find very, very interesting images made by the indigenous African. Now, sculpture, basically, we used so many methods, such as carving, modeling, and then casting. Now, some of these artifacts made by the African include stools, ceremonial swords, statues, masks, as well as musical instruments like drums. Again, on your screen, I managed to get some few images for you to observe. So on the top, we have the stool. I think you are very familiar with this type of stool, usually belonging to the Khans of Ghana. Then that's a mask. I believe that's the, one of the Nook 
mask from Nigeria. Then we have ceremonial swords, and then we have drums. Remember, these are just a few samples of some of the images of sculptural materials or artifacts made by Africans or indigenous Africans. Now, these artifacts, such as statues and masks, played religious or spiritual purposes, or they were used for spiritual and religious purposes. And also, as a form of, or a way that we use to worship our God. And then also to venerate the ancestors. Now, drums and flutes and swords, uh, stools were used for performing so many purposes, such as for entertainment, and also used in our household activities. Now, drums and flutes, like we said, are used for entertainment. So you can see an African right on this image. So he's playing the flute, and there's another one playing the drum, and they are engaged in a musical activity. On the far right-hand side, there's some form of entertainment. You can see people drumming at the background with a lady in front having some nice dance. I wish I could dance like that. So let's move to sculpture. These are some of the sample images I got for you from indigenous Africans. Um, look at how these buildings have been constructed and they reflect the indigenous African. So usually they are made of mud, as you can see in all three. And I believe this particular one is made of touch and then other raffia or some leaves. So that's how the African used to make his builders or make, build up some of these structures. Now local materials such as red clay, dried bricks, bamboo, raffia, and palm branches were used in constructing architectural structures. Now structures are used as places of worship, such as these temples and shrines. Now, others like our homes and market squares and community centers, which play social roles, are also built in our societies. Now, houses that serve as shelter for individuals and families were usually simple in design, and then, but that of temples and shrines, which are more of social centers, had more complex designs. Now, the shapes of the building usually symbolize the meaning. For example, shrines were usually in a circular form, and the symbolism behind is that anything circular deals with perfection of God or associated with God. Now let's move on to textiles. On our screens, we have beautiful textile designs right here in Africa. On the far left, you have the Kuba Raffia cloth, which comes from Congo. In the middle, we have the Kente of the Ashantis, usually of the Ashantis. I know other places like the Ivorians also have a form of Kente. So on the right-hand side, we also have the Shivenda cloth, uh, that comes from South Africa, another very beautiful cloth. African cloth and textiles are very, very beautiful. They are colorful. Now, usually, cotton, silk, raffia, jute, and so on are used in producing such fabrics, and they play varied or several roles. The techniques basically used were weaving, printing, dyeing, applique, and some of these textile productions were mainly of indigenous African origins. Now, some of the fabrics produced were also worn to enhance personal appearances, while others, like the talisman and amulets, were worn for protective and spiritual purposes. So look at the image on the far right-hand side of your screen. There is an image of a man well protected by amulets and talisman all over his dress or his uh, body. So he's worn a special dress, mainly looking like a war dress, and it has a lot of these amulets and talisman in them, mainly for protection against spiritual forces. Now, again, special costumes were worn before religious duties. So for instance, when the traditional priest and his attendants were having an occasion, they would wear special costumes which are usually made from raffia, 
before such, before such uh, sacrifices are made to the gods and ancestors. So again, there's an image there with a, a, a traditional priest and his entourage engaged in some form of spiritual uh, activity. Again, in our indigenous African, we wear special clothes, especially among the Ashantis of Ghana, where they wear the Kente cloth during festive occasions. So when there's a wedding ceremony or there's a naming ceremony, you find Africans wearing special textile fabric for such occasions. So in the image that you see there, there's a mixture of Kente and Edinkra um, fabric worn by this gorgeous men and they are looking very nice and that is what the African or the indigenous African stands for. You can see they are very colorful and very very unique to our culture. Now other textiles items that are made include curtains and mats which are used for decorating the interiors of our buildings. Now let's move to painting. Paintings were done on walls of temples and shrines as well as on doors, on the mask, as on statues, and drums. So in your picture, that's the Tebele painted houses. The Tebele live around uh, Burkina Faso, that's the upper part of Ghana, and they usually share a border, or they share a border with Ghana. Now they have these beautiful, beautiful paintings on their walls, and you can see them from the images. They are very, very innovative, and they have this uh, geometric patterns that they make on their walls and use them as very, very, uh, uh, very, very nice pieces. I wish we could visit this place to look at exactly how these buildings look like. I've heard the Tebele painted houses are, are very unique, and every single home in that small village has a form of art around it, usually geometric forms. Again, we can see some paintings. Uh, the one on the left shows a painted drum being played. So there are this series of drums. They are painted in these colors. Um, the ones that you see are drums here in Ghana. Again, they are painted mask of West Africa. There are other paintings that are made on various or varied artifacts. I want you to look out for some of them. Now, colors used had a symbolic meaning. So, for example, if we pick the color red and apply it to a mask or statue, then we are saying it's representing a malicious and wicked god or ancestor. But when the cool color, or a cool color or calm color, like blue and green is used, then it is said that, yes, the object that is being painted has a forgiving and generous or it's, it's for a generous or forgiving God. So these two colors are rightly on the opposite side, for, for warm colors and then for cool colors. Now special signs and symbols are usually, which have uh, affinity with special gods or ancestors, are painted on the walls of our temples and also in our homes, just as a form of spiritual protection. Now let's move to poetry. Now, pots and other containers are modeled with clay or from clay, metal, and other uh, uh, moldable material. Now, most of these pots are, and are containers and are used for storage purposes and also for carrying out chores in the home. So again, in these images, I have some pots, very nice pots. So the one that I've just ticked is made of clay. The next one that you have here is made up of metal. On the far right hand side, you can see an African who's going to fetch water at the river using a pot. Now, other pots are used for spiritual and religious purposes, such as storing relics of ancestors, keeping witchcraft powers, keeping special herbs, for the performance of certain rituals, and also used for keeping jewels, and also as well as what? Concussions for spiritual healings. So again, you can see from the image, 
there are some series of pots in that big bowl that you see with some images believed to represent certain gods. So that's the pot to serve the divine found here in West Africa. Now the shapes of these pots were sometimes symbolic. Example, pots for st storing water and for pouring libation to the Supreme God had to be circular because anything circular has to do with perfection. Anything circular is a symbol of perfection. Now those used in puberty rites were usually oval shaped. The oval shape to the African is a symbol of beauty. So depending on which shape that pot looks like, then these references are given to them. Now let's move to beadwork. Now beads are string in the form of necklaces, bracelets, wrist, wristlets, and they are worn on the body for various purposes. A typical example in Ghana, we have this puberty, right? So this puberty girl adorns herself with beads as a form of beauty and also to enhance her appearance. So you can see the pu puberty girl with beads on, very beautiful beads and unique to the African culture. Beads are also worn for medicinal purposes. Uh, for example, a child who frequently falls sick, uh, such as having feverish and headaches, always feeling feverish and also having headaches, may wear some of these bracelets which are stringed with seashells and is believed to enchant or prevent such sicknesses. So there's a sample image on your screen to explain exactly what we mean by beads for protection. Now other beads are also worn as a form of identification of one's family or even the social status of that person. Others are also worn for spiritual protection against witches and evil spirits. So you can see the beads on a chief, which is very col colorful. Um, most probably he is the chief of a very important place. So you can see the beads all over with other artifacts around the hands and neck. So let's quickly move to basketry. So basketry or baskets were produced from cane, palm branches, and branches of palm, again, were also produced from raffia and elephant grass. So I've tried to look for images of each one of these so that you can comprehend what I'm trying to say. So we have a cane basket here. Then there's a palm branch basket. Again, there's a palm branches basket. And then there's an elephant grass basket. So there are so many materials used for our baskets here in indigenous Africa. There are so many others that we couldn't readily find, but you could research upon it and find more about it. Again, in basketry, they are woven in either a very simple form or intricate forms and also in gorgeous patterns. These baskets were used for storing farm produce, also for personal storing personal belongings and other vital items, as you can see in the images. Now, let's move to calabash work. Now, gods and calabashes are used for creating fascinating artifacts. Now, their surfaces were usually lavishly decorated with beautiful and symbolic patterns. Sometimes, heated metal tools are pierced or or appears on used as special patterns on the such surfaces, just like you see in, on those images over there. So these are calabashes which have been decorated, very beautiful and unique in nature. It will interest you that any part or various parts of Africa have these calabashes, but how they decorate them are unique to their culture. They are also used for decorating interiors of shrines and temples. And especially in the northern part of Ghana, we use these calabashes to store substances, including shea butter. So on the right, you see a shea butter market here in the northern part of Ghana. A lot of shea butter, as you can see on your screens. Gods 
are also used for music, making musical instruments, such as xylophones and then rattles. Have you seen a xylophone before? That's an image there. It produces very unique sound, and these sounds are unique to Africa, indigenous Africa. Again, there's a rattle, also another form of musical instrument, basically used during our church activities today. But in the indigenous times, they were used for various festivals and other ceremonies. Now, for leather work, the skins and hides of animals are treated and used for protection or production of various artifacts. So on your screens, I have different hides and skins of varied animals. Do you identify some of these animals? I can see a zebra, the skin of a zebra. Uh, that's an antelope. That looks like a cobra. Okay. And other animals that you see. So these are some of the skins and hides, the basic uh, materials for our leather work here in Africa. Now, items like shoes, slippers, hats, and costumes were worn on the body for protective and decorative purposes. So you can see some leather products. Uh, we have the sandals, uh, we have the hat, then we have the bag. There are varied other forms of leather work products made by the indigenous African. So let's move to blacksmithing. So blacksmithing is an area that deals with metal arts and it consists of production of articles made from brass, iron, silver, and other metals that you know. Now, these metals are usually heated at very high temperature to make them malleable so that they can be shaped into any or formed into any shape. Uh, usually, they are made into shape on the anvil. So on your screen, you see a blacksmith trying to heat his metals to make his blacksmithing activities. Now, some of these uh, images that you see are products made from blacksmithing. So the indigenous African produce um, swords, daggers, knives, spears, and other war and agricultural implements. So you can see on your screen some knives and daggers made by some of these indigenous Africans. Again, on the image below, we also see some farming implements used during the farming activities or agricultural activities of the African. Then we move to goldsmithing. So artifacts made with gold inclu included uh, rings, crowns, hairpins, cups, uh, bowls, gold weights, necklaces, and weights, or wrist, uh, wristlets, uh, if I may say. So if you look on your screens, uh, there are some gold weights, especially of the Ashanti Kingdom of Ghana. Um, can you identify some of these gold weights? I can see a jewelry box in the middle with so many other little, little artifacts, all made in gold. Again, if you look down there, we have some necklaces and uh, rings and bracelets uh, of the Ashanti Kingdom. Uh, very interesting. If you may, if you may know, all these are made in pure gold. And um, among the Ashantis, the pure gold represents your status in the society. Now, the articles produced for, are produced for identification purposes, such as depicting those of social class. Again, the chief and elders of the traditional groups are decorated with gold articles different from ordinary cities. So if you look at the Ashanti king, whose image is there, he's in his full regalia, made of gold. So his subjects are holding uh, these um, swords, plated with gold. The king himself has these bracelets fully made of gold. There's gold hanging all over, all over his neck and on the head. And these are very powerful people. So, having these articles on depicts your social status, just like you see with Ashanti King. Now, body arts in indigenous Africa were mainly body painting, coiffure, and body marks. 
So what is body painting, what is coiffure, and what is body marks? Now, paintings served numerous purposes, including religious, medicinal, political, spiritual, war, and recreational purposes. I want us to particularly look at this particular one. So the image there is the Nomad Mills Courtship Festival. This festival is held in the northern part of Niger. And these are males. Don't be deceived. These are not females. They are males. During such occasions, they paint their faces. Uh, it's a form of courtship festival. So they paint their bodies and have some, a lot of dances and entertainment. And people are there to praise them. And there's a form of courtship after such ceremonies. A traditional priestess paints herself with white clay while performing rituals to the ancestor. Now the color, which is white, um, chosen by her, indicates success in her performance. So the white that they smear all over their body is a symbol of success for whatever act activity that they are going to perform. Now body arts like the coiffure, which is concerned with the shape and treatment of the hair, also bloomed in the indigenous African times. So the hair was braided dyed and shaped in various forms to serve purposes such as for identification, for decoration, and also as a form of status in the society. So we see a Fulani girl there with a special coiffure as a hairdo, hairstyle, and this belongs to a Fulani who comes from Guinea. Again, we have another coiffure on the right hand side from the Zandi of Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, my research says that that lady that I find there was the wife of one of the favorite kings in DR Congo. Again, body marks such as mutilations, scarifications, cicatrizations were made on the body to serve medicinal for identification, religious and decorative, as well as spiritual purposes. So I've given just one example of tribal scarifications made by indigenous Africans. So this tribal mark will be able to tell exactly where this individual comes from. Unfortunately, we have ignored most of these body marks. Um, back in times when you have these marks on your body, the indigenous African was able to identify exactly which ethnic group that you belong to. And in case if you're a child, you get missing. By your tribal mark alone, the scarifications on your body, we are able to tell exactly where you come from. And most likely you'll be sent back to where you belong. But we have ignored such cultures. We are not doing them anymore. But they are very interesting. Now, there are other scatterization forms and mutilations that I could not readily add to today's lessons because some of them look very scary. So look for them yourselves. I want you to really research find some of these mutilations and um, other form of cicatrizations made on the bodies. Very interesting ones and you marvel and sometimes ask questions, how are these things made on the body? But for this occasion, I just selected these scarifications for us to study. But look for the other ones and see how they look like. Now, we are done with the visual arts. So we've gone through sculpture, poetry, beadwork, a calabash work um, gone through goldsmithing and the others. So there were other forms, like we said, like the performing arts. Now they are the arts that are played or performed and perceived with the sense of sight and felt by the senses of touch. Now that indigenous Africans made use of performing art forms in the form of music, drama, and then dance. Now for music, the indigenous African played them during very special occasions, such as festivals and debates. And during such occasions, this music was played to invoke the spirits of our ancestors and deities to join the occasion. Again, music was also meant to entertain those in attendance for such occasions. Again, during such ceremonies or occasions, we, such as rites of passage, we play music for the group of people who are involved. 
Again, we play music during, uh, during the occasion of performing our household chores. Again, we, during rituals in temples and shrines, there's music available. So the African had a lot of music being played at varied, varied times of the day or for various occasions or ceremonies. Now, another form of performing arts is drama. Drama and other forms of theoretical performances are used during initiation ceremonies to give instructions and to train the young initiates. If you remember from what we discussed previously, during initiations, these young ones are given special uh, treatments in the form of training them as to how to become adults in their societies. And during such performances, there's drama that is shown, uh, is ex uh, they are exposed to this drama and other theoretical performances so that they could understand their culture and way of life. There's also uh, storytelling sessions, uh, drama plays, which have vibrant roles in highlighting and giving moral lessons are uh, organized. And then the audience also participates and interact with the actors and actresses during such performances. If you go to a typical African um, traditional dance, you realize those participants are really in the mood. And then those who are also observing usually jump in to have a share of this drama and dance. Now, dance performances were routines during festivals, derbes, rituals, and ceremonies in our indigenous societies in Africa. Even till today, these dances are performed and they are very vital to our existence. Now, let's move to verbal arts. Now, these are arts performed orally and it gives or involves words that uh, involves words as well as body movements and some occasionally they are accompanied with songs. Now, verbal arts include incantations, poetry, recitals, their storytelling, their digests, appellations, proverbs, idioms, prayers, and libations. I, partic I particularly in one like a lot of storytelling. I think it's very, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, if you happen to be uh, as old as I am, during our young times, our daddies will call us, we sit on the ground, and then there are special stories told to us. These are all forms of verbal arts invented by the indigenous African. Now, let's look at the characteristics of indigenous African art. So Africans had a unique way of making their art, and they bore special characteristics. So indigenous African art has distinct traits from other cultures across this world. Our African or indigenous African arts are unique and cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Now, these arts are mainly labeled as primitive, old-fashioned, and ritualistic. Even today, we are believed to, or we are made to believe that our form of arts are not supposed to be uh, 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 used because they are very primitive, they are old-fashioned, and ritualistic, which shouldn't be so. Now, what was the purpose of the African engaging himself in indigenous African arts. What are some of these characteristics that makes the African arts unique? So we are going to look at these ones that we have on our screens. First, the African arts or African arts are functional. Again, they are symbolic. African arts relate to everyday life. African arts are common to all members of the society. African arts were used for educational purposes as well as they were used to record past events. So this indigenous African arts had these characteristics. So let's take a look at each one of them and let's describe them. So we start out with African arts being functional. So African arts were used for performing various roles in everyday activities. They are not art for art's sake, but serve a specific or a variety of functions such as utilitarian, medicinal, for identification, spiritual, or religious purposes. 
So the African basically did not just do his art for fun. It wasn't art for art's sake. It wasn't just that he wanted to make some form of art, so he just embarks on it. Most of the works that we did in African art were basically functional. They were used for special activities. It was just not art for art's sake. That's what is very important about African or indigenous African art. Again, African arts were symbolic. So indigenous African arts had meanings beyond what you see. So the shape, the color of art forms are symbolic and they have logical meanings. Others even have spiritual connotations. So any African art back then had a special meaning or symbolic meaning attached to it. Again, African arts related to everyday life. So indigenous Africans forms are made from, from or for used for performing daily activities, if I may say. So one cannot separate a single activity from an art form. They form a vital force of everyday life activities. So the African use it in performing household chores. When there are religious services, you find art forms. When there are special occupational duties, there are art forms. There are festivals and other occasions, you find art forms. So the art forms could not be alien from the various uh, activities of the African. Now, African art was also common to all members of the society. So the perceptions, the ideologies, and the beliefs behind art forms are understood and shared by all members of that community. So the arts that belong to one community belong to everyone in that community. So it's not a loan property of any individual, but belongs to that particular community in which that art form is practiced. So no one is the sole custodian of a particular art form, but the art form that was made was meant for everybody in that society. And basically, everybody even knew how to make those art forms, one way or the other. Again, African art forms were or served educational purposes. It was used to give instructions involving various divisions of life, such as community living, for health, uh, when they're making laws, or even teaching the art of war. During initiation ceremonies, the arts are used as teaching aids during their training. So, like we said, if a child or a child reaches puberty, then they have to go through special rites. And these are you, this form of African arts were used for these special educational purposes. They were used to teach these young ones so that they could be full members of that particular society. Again, African arts were used to record past events. So in particular societies where mostly back then in indigenous times there were no written history, these art forms served as history books. So you could look at the art forms and you could relate it to the history of that people. They give us first-hand information about the cultural heritage and our traditional ways of life. They are used for recording memorial events of the past. Have you seen any art form that relates to history uh, of your people? You should find out about that. So you realize, yes, art was not made for just its sake. Now, to end up this lesson, we have to identify the role of the indigenous art forms in the African society. Again, we have to state five reasons why the indigenous African made his art, and that it shouldn't be labeled as what? Primitive. Look at these two questions very well. Try to relate it to what we have learned so far. Do a little more research about it, because there are varied examples that you can also find around uh, in your research areas. So look at them. Uh, I want you to look at them very carefully and answer them as and when. Can you identify some of the rules um, these art forms perform in our African society? Uh, do that and then possibly send them to me for me to watch and then comment on them. Again, look for some reasons why we say African arts are not primitive. 
So here, obviously, you have to look at some of the characteristics of the African art that didn't make it look primitive. Now, this particular lesson will be a basics upon which we are going to also look at the contemporary aspects of African art forms. So make sure you really understand the ba basic concepts and these various art forms practiced by the African so that when we move on to the various aspects or how art was influenced or how native art were influenced by other cultures, you should be able to be able to understand the things that we did earlier and why we are doing particular things now. So until we meet for that next lessons, I want you to go through, like I said, make sure you've jotted down a lot of points, send them to me, and I'll take a look at it. So this has been Kojo Usuapia once again. Uh, we've gone through our GK lessons for today on indigenous African art. I'll meet you the next time. Have a nice day. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.